The title of our talk this morning, and it's 1226, it will be an hour or less, is the big picture in the sanctuary. When you're going into the book of Exodus and the book of Leviticus and you're reading about the trespass offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, you're reading about all of these different things that were done, it can be sometimes confusing. It's like, how do you sort this all out? And um, when I was, when I volunteered to speak this Sabbath, um, I, I thought about just making it so simple that you just couldn't miss it at all. I was gonna say, you know, Bible study, prayer, and witnessing are the three things in the holy place. And the Lord said, don't, 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 don't sell out. Just go ahead and talk about deep things but take it your time, go slower so that people can understand. So we're going to try again, okay? The Bible says that I have not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things. What does the last phrase say? Yea, what? The deep things of God. Bow your heads. Father God, we pray that your spirit will come right now and open up to our understanding some of the deep things of God. We pray that you would show us our deficiencies, that you would show us ourselves, that we would see ourselves as heaven sees us, and that we might make preparation for what is coming. Thank you for your spirit, which teaches deep things, as you've asked it in Jesus' name. Amen. What is the purpose of the sanctuary? The first five questions are on your handout here so that if you, you can go back and review those. The Bible says in Psalms 21 and 2, The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble, the name of the God of Jacob, defend thee, send thee, what's the next word? Send thee, what's that word in blue? Help, Help from the sanctuary and strengthen them out of Zion. The number one purpose of the sanctuary is that you and I are in such a terrible situation, you need help. And it comes from the golden rooms in heaven. In what areas is the sanctuary to give us help? The Bible says in Psalms 96 and verse six, honor and majesty are before him. What two things? What does it say, read it for me. Strength and beauty are where? In his sanctuary. So what is it gonna help us concerning? The sanctuary is going to help you to have spiritual strength and it's going to help you to have beauty. Spiritual strength and beauty. Why do we need strength from the sanctuary? Psalm 76, one through three. Right there on your sheet it says, in Judah is God known, his name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. What's the next word there? There, there at his tabernacle break he the arrows of the bow, the shield, and the sword. And the last one says, there he breaks the battle. We need strength from the sanctuary. It says on your sheet there, for the battle against sin, self, and Satan. There is a warfare. If you read Psalms 144, the first couple, first couple of verses, it's a prayer where David says, teach my fingers and my hands to fight. And the tabernacle is going to give us strength for this spiritual warfare that we have. What is the beauty that the sanctuary provides? Here it is, Psalms 29, verse two. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in what? The beauty of holiness. So the beauty that the sanctuary is going to give to us is an inner spiritual beauty. An inner spiritual beauty. To whom is that beauty to be revealed? The Bible answers that question. It says, and the, what does it say there in yellow? Heathen. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. That spiritual beauty, this is largely how the warfare is going to be fought. That spiritual beauty is going to be seen by unbelieving people all the, around the world. Do you know that people don't believe that Christianity is real? Do you know that? Yeah. They believe that every Christian is a hypocrite. I don't have time to tell you a story, but I'll tell you one quick story. When I used to work in prison, um, there was a, a spectacular fall of a televangelist 
And I remember going to the gymnasium and I was in the gym on one side of the lockers and on the other side was a Jehovah Witness. This guy was an ex um, college football player. He was about six, seven, 320 pounds. And he was in the gym shouting at the top of his voice that all oh, Christians are hypocrites. There isn't one Christian that follows what Jesus says. And he was shouting and I was, he didn't even know I was in there. I was on the other side of the locker room and I was over there and I was, got down on my knees and I started praying. I said, oh God, show this man that there are people that they live what the Bible says, that they stand. Just because a televangelist falls doesn't mean that every Christian is a hypocrite. The world is waiting to see people that have that character, that beauty. And in the last days, God is going to overthrow his enemies through his bride. Through who? Through his bride. The Bible says that the God of peace, Paul wrote, shall bruise Satan where? Under where? Under your feet. He's talking to the church. He says, God of peace, God is going to bruise Satan under the feet of the church. He's going to do it surely. God is going to have a bride that's going to be strong for spiritual warfare, and she's going to be all glorious within it, says in, in Psalms 45. And there are various stories in the Bible that talk about how God is going to use the church to take all of his enemies out. And one of those stories is found in Judges chapter 9, you know that story, where Abimelech, who was a type of Satan, the Bible says that Abimelech killed all of his brothers in one day. The Bible says of Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning. And he attacked the king and the kingdom of Judah. And he was, and all the people retreated in one city into a tower. And the Bible says that he fought hard against this tower. And he was going to set the door of that tower on fire to burn the people that were inside. And the Bible says that, a, what does it say? A certain woman cast a piece of millstone upon Abimelech's head all to break his skull to break his skull. And um, that story, as well as many other stories, is typifying how God is gonna use the church in the last days to bring down the enemy. In the sanctuary service, it's represented as a fit man that does a strange work on the end of the Day of Atonement. The sanctuary is a gold mine of doctrinal truth. It talks about many different things but what we want to talk about in our next 45 minutes is what it teaches about holy living, what it teaches about righteousness by faith. What is the ultimate goal of the sacrificial system? When Adam and Eve sinned, God set up a sacrifice where they could offer sacrifices there at the gate of the Garden of Eden. And it says that when man fell by transgression, the law was not changed but a remedial system was established. Remedial means corrective, to, 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 to remedy the problem. The, the sanctuary um, sacrificial system was a remedial system established to bring man back to what? What does it say there in the video for me? It says, back to obedience. So the whole purpose of it, it's not just to, not just to pardon your sins, the purpose of it is to bring you back into a state where you can obey. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It empowers you. It's not just something that just washes away the problem. It actually corrects and rectifies the problem. There's something in all of this symbolism that's going to reestablish God's image and put his power and his spirit back in you so that you can do um, what the angels are doing in heaven, and that's obeying God 100% all of the time. Now, in order for us to understand the sanctuary, we have to understand some basics. We went over this the last time I was here. This um, curtain in the front is called the gate of the court. Say that. Gate of the court. This brass altar is called brazen altar or altar of burnt offering. This area enclosed by the white linen fence is called the courtyard. What's it called? Courtyard. The big brass bowl is called the labor. What's it called? Labor. This first veil of the building is called the first veil. What's it called? There's another veil back here. That's called the second veil. So you have the gate of the court, first veil, second veil. The building is called the tabernacle. What's it called? It's also called the sanctuary. What's, what was it also called? 
and when it was permanently built by stone, it was called the temple. Called what? Okay. The first and larger room was called the holy place. What was it called? And the second smaller room is called the most holy place. Called what? All right, here's your quiz. What's this called right here? Gate of the court. What's this area called in the white linen fence? What's this altar called? Also called? Burnt altar of burnt offering or praising altar. What's this big brass bowl called? What's this building called? What was it also called? And when it was built permanently by stone, what was it called? It had two rooms. What was the first room called? And the second room was called? And the curtain that was at the entrance of the holy place was, was called what? First veil. First veil. And the curtain that was in the entry to the second room was called the what? Second veil. This area here is called the inner court. This area here is called the outer court. In the holy place, there were three pieces of furniture, table of showbread, golden candlestick, altar of incense. And then behind the second veil, it's pulled aside. It wasn't like that normally. You can see the Ark of the Covenant. So what's this table called? What's this lampstand called? Golden candlestick. And what's this called? Or the golden altar, or the altar that was before the Lord. What's this, this curtain called? Second veil. This curtain is called the second veil. And what's the piece of furniture in the most holy place? Okay, you need to know that before we go on to our next things. The phrase, the sanctuary message, you'll hear people say sanctuary message, sanctuary message. That phrase is a fancy term for the plan of redemption. What does sanctuary message mean? It's just a fancy term for the plan of redemption. The plan that God put into motion that has existed from eternity. How long has the plan existed? From eternity. You can find it in Desire of Ages on page 22. Desire of Ages, page 22 says that, it was, that the plan of redemption was not an afterthought. It was the unfolding of principles that have existed from eternity. That's Desire of Ages, page 22. And so this plan is also referred to as the sanctuary message. That's an Adventist phrase. And it comes from the book Great Controversy on the two most important pages. If you don't read any spirit of prophecy, you should read these two pages, 488 and 489. Those two pages have an overview that has a hundred different points that are important. And on that page it says the sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work on behalf of men. It concerns how many people? Every, Every soul living upon the earth. It opens to view what? It opens to view the plan of redemption. Last time that we were together, I explained to you that the plan of redemption moves in two directions. It moves in how many directions? Two directions. So the symbols are going to move in two directions. Where did the plan of redemption first begin? Where was the decision first made to save man? Yes. In heaven. It was first made in heaven. And Jesus said, I will go and I will rescue them. They're in a, a terrible condition. He said, the Father, I offer to go to rescue mankind. So the plan moved from heaven to earth. earth. So the white fence represents, this courtyard represents earth. It represents what? Earth. The golden rooms represent heaven. And the plan began in heaven, it moved to earth. Jesus was here for 33 years, he went to the cross. And then where did the plan of redemption go? It went back to heaven. It went, Jesus lived for 30 years, he died on the cross, and then it went back to heaven. And then Jesus ministered here for 18 centuries. And then he did a second work and he ministered since 1844 in this room. And then, after Jesus finishes in heaven, where is the plan of redemption going to go to then? Back to earth. And you can see that there's a little bit of courtyard behind here. And that little bit of courtyard means that the plan of redemption is going to go back to earth for just a very short time. Jesus is going to come from heaven. He's going to pick up all his people. And then where are we going to go? Woo! We're going to be getting our praise on for how long? Forever. 
thousand years. A thousand years, not forever, a thousand years. And then what's going to happen after a thousand years? Where's the planet going to move then? It's going to move back to Earth. Let me tell you something else. Earth is actually going to become heaven. Amen. Heaven's going to move. Heaven says, you know what? All that trouble that you caused, I'm moving my throne there. This will be the center of the universe. That's how it's going to be. And so in the sanctuary, when we start to look at these symbols, the symbols have to be looked from looking from west to east, and the symbols have to be looked from east to west. God, he put it all in this little simple little diagram. He's going to explain some things that we need to understand in order for us to be rescued. The Bible text on this page is Ephesians 1.10 that says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he, God, would gather together in one how many things? All things in Christ, both which are in where and which are on earth. So through Jesus, it's like a, you know how you, when you show you have a rolling stitch where it goes between the two edges? Through Jesus, he's going to, the family in heaven that's, that they've been wanting to be with us for all these times, and the family on earth that wants to be in heaven, Jesus is going to put, he's going to go, Heaven, earth, heaven, earth, heaven, earth. And he's going to bring it all together and we'll be all one happy family. And after the thousand years in the lake of fire, it'll be for how long will we be together? It'll be for eternity. All right. We talked about that there's how many books that talk about the plan of redemption? What's the first book that was given to Adam and Eve? The first book that explains the plan of redemption. The book of creation, God's word in nature. Later on, they had oral tradition and they wrote down things that were in the Bible. And um, the third book is the sanctuary book. The sanctuary book is God's word in pictures. It's God. So the holy book is God's word in writing. The book of creation is God's word in nature. And the sanctuary book is God's word in pictures. We talked about it the last time, that there's a reason that God gave it to them in pictures. And by the way, the plan of redemption plays out on a 12-month cycle. In the book of nature, you have spring, summer, fall, winter, and then it renews every 12 months. In the sanctuary book, you're going to find you have daily service that went for all the days except for one. Then you had on one day you had a yearly service and it starts all over. And by the way, your Bible, you should read it through once, at least every what? Year. Every year. You should try to read through your Bible. Go and look at the plan of redemption in the Holy Book. Now, if you had a, a box that was a puzzle, and the pieces were turned face down, so all you saw was the cardboard side, and you didn't have the big picture of what the puzzle was, could you put that puzzle together? No. Could you do it? If, you, if the pieces were face down, it would be almost impossible to, to know which pieces go where, how they connect, which piece connects with which piece. You could not even figure it out. That was why God gave the third book, the sanctuary book, because the sanctuary book is going to show you the big picture, and then you will be able to plug in all of the little pieces. In our spiritual walk, we're having a hard time praying. We're having a hard time studying. We're having a hard time witnessing. We don't understand what we're supposed to be doing in our spiritual walk. And so God says, look, I'm going to give it to you in picture form. And when you look at the picture and see the big picture, you'll say, ah, that's where this fits in. This is why that's important. And then it will give energy. It will give focus to these little pieces in, of puzzle in your spiritual walk. The plan of redemption divides into two major categories. They're called events and experiences. The events are what God does to rescue us. The events, who does them? God, God does. The experience is, or what does it say here? What we do, how? By God's grace. Did Jesus die for all men? Yes. Will all men be saved? No. Why not? Why not? Not all men will respond to what the provision is made for them. They will choose and say, I don't want that. They'll go in the direction. So the events are connected to the experiences, but your salvation is provided prime, first and foremost. 
foremost by what God has done. Praise the Lord that God took the initiative and he did some things. And so salvation is a cooperative experience. Here's the Bible proof. It says, for we are laborers together with God. That means God does a part, you do a part. God's going to do his part faithfully. The problem is we're not doing our part. And that's why we're having so much difficulty. So the sanctuary gives us the big picture. It's the big puzzle that shows us, it gives deep spiritual insight into all the little pieces. It's going to say, I'm going to look at the golden altar and it's going to tell me what I need to know about prayer. And it's going to have the big picture where it's going to show what God's overarching purpose is to bring man back to obedience and to put sin out of the universe. The overarching purpose is he's going to get rid of sin. And he and anybody that claims to it, unfortunately, he'll have to get rid of them. But the sanctuary is a plan to separate sin from you so he can destroy sin and keep you. Say praise the Lord. Whew, I'm glad you have a plan for that. You know that when, you can look this up on Google, do you know that when filters were first put on cigarettes, it was after they discovered it caused cancer, and they said, we will develop something that will allow people to keep smoking and not get cancer. That was the purpose of all filters on cigarettes. You can Google it, it's a whole history of that. That's what the false gospel does today. They want to let you keep sinning and still save you. But, but it doesn't work that way. God says, I must separate sin from my people so that I can burn up sin and get rid of it. The events in the plan of redemption, there are six events that we should study in order. And I raced through this the last time I was here. I'm going to try to take just 10 minutes on it and try to explain it a little bit more thoroughly so that you can see the value of this. This, this purple curtain here is called what? It's called the gate of the court. This curtain, the first veil, and the second veil all represent Jesus taking on a body. I'll show you that in the Bible in just a minute. It represents, what does it say to read that word? The incarnation means Jesus coming in human flesh. This was the first event in the plan of redemption that Father said, somebody's got to go. Jesus said, I will go. I will go and I will become one of them to teach them how to walk. I will do it. That was the incarnation. The brazen altar represents the crucifixion that took place on Calvary. That's where the sacrifice was slain next to that altar, and that's where it was burned and consumed on that altar. This golden room represents Jesus, what? Read it for me. His what? His holy place ministry. This whole room represents Jesus' work in the first apartment. And then after 18 centuries, this second room represents what? His, read it for me. His most holy place ministry. And that ministry, if you keep going west, it will eventually come to an end. That back wall represents the end of Jesus' most holy place ministry. And we have a name for that. That's called, what is it called? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Right now, you can accept Jesus as your Savior. A time is coming soon. It will be too late to accept him. Right now, he's doing a work of actually transforming, shaping, molding, reconstructing his sons and daughters. And a time will come when he'll take the censer he'll say no more. That him that is righteous be righteous still. This white linen fence right here represents Jesus coming to, what does the courtyard represent? The courtyard in general. The earth. So this represents Jesus coming to earth. The first time, this back wall represents Jesus coming to earth when? The second time. So there are six events. What are the six events? What's, this, what's the first event? What's this event here? It's crucifixion. What's this event represent? No, no, which one? Holy, Holy place, man. What does this room represent? Holy. And that back wall represents what? Holy. And that white linen fence in the back of the court represents what? Holy. Okay, these six events are things that we need to be able to explain to people out of the Bible. Because the events unfold God's motive 
in the plan of redemption. It's telling us something about him that's very important. And his motive is what? His motive is love. Jeremiah 31, 3. Yea, I have loved thee with a everlasting love. That's what it says. Look at that word everlasting. It says the, an unseen terminal point. In other words, it's so far in the back, you can't see the beginning of it. It's so far in the future, you can't see the end of it. It's an expansive, everlasting love. God's love, shining through the prism of the sanctuary, refracts into different colors and shades. And all of these events, they're actually telling us a different aspect of his love. His love is so broad, so deep, so profound. He says, look, I, I have to reveal my love to you in a variety of ways for you to kind of grasp it with your narrow mind. And um, his love is so deep and so profound that it's going to lead him to take us as his bride and to marry us forever and cause you and I to sit on his throne which reigns the universe. You didn't catch what I just said. His love is so good. He says, when I'm through cleaning you up, you will sit on my throne as co-regents of the expansive universe. And so this love is the love that God has for his church to make his, her his bride. You know, um, um, Ephesians 5, husband love your wife and Christ love the church. And here, 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says, I espouse you to one husband to present you as a chaste version to Christ. So each of these events are being done for you and for me because that's how his love he has. He says, I want to marry you. I want to commit myself to you forever. And so him coming down to this world was him living his life under the same conditions that you have to live. He says, you know what? I want to walk where you have to walk. I want to experience hunger. I want to experience um, being weary and tired and all the difficulties. I want to experience how you have opposition and people against you. I want to show my love for you by just walking in your shoes. He, uh, at Calvary, he says, I want to show my love for you by dying the death that you deserve to die. I'm going to take the penalty that you're supposed to get, and I'll take it happily for you. In the holy place, he says, I'm going to do a work of just washing you, reconstructing you, building you up to make you into the woman that I want to marry forever. In the most holy place, he's going to marry us. And then at the close of probation, he's going to punish the tormentors of his pride. Just before probation closes, no husband will allow someone to harass his wife endlessly without penalty. And God is going to, near the end of probation, he's going to say, you know what? There's some powers on the earth that have been harassing my people, and I'm going to deal with them at this time because I love my bride. And at the second coming, the Bible says, I have not seen or ear heard, neither entered the heart of men, the things which God has prepared. We're going to see some aspects of his benevolence and generosity, such as we can't even comprehend. He's going to take us home. So all of these events were done as for his bride. Let's talk just for just 10 minutes about these events quickly because I believe that this is part of the reason why we're having so much difficulty obeying is that we don't spend enough time talking about God's um, these events that reveal his love in different aspects. Now, why do we say that those three curtains, the gate, the first, and second veil, represent his body? How can we show that? Here, let me show you in Hebrews 10, it talks about God making a new and living way for us, in which he gets consecrated through the veil that is to say, what does it say there? So all of these curtains, the gate of the court, the first veil, and the second veil, represent Jesus' flesh. If you didn't have Hebrews 10, all you would need is the Gospels. Because at the very moment that Jesus' body was destroyed on the cross, the Bible says that he gave up 
he gave up the ghost. At that same split second, the Bible says that what happened? The veil of the temple was what? Rent in twain. And it shows that that veil represents his body. So that gate of the court, Jesus' life is going to teach us the, how to walk the courtyard experience. That first veil, Jesus' life, that he lived in his body, teaches us how to have that holy place experience. That second veil, Jesus' life, that he lived in the flesh, is going to teach us how to have the most holy place experience. It's the life that he lived is the key to unlocking these three experiences. Now, the incarnation, Jesus taking on a body, brought some other things to light. Remember that the Gable appeared to Mary and said that she was going to be with child. She says, how can that be? I've never known a man. She said, the Holy Ghost will overshadow you and you will be, um, you will be with child from, from, the, from, from the spirit, essentially. And, um, she, and that, that miracle of Jesus coming and, and becoming a human being um, is telling us something about God. What is, it what is it telling you when you have an infinite God who lives in, in goal and eternity and light unapproachable and he comes down to have a little tiny corruptible body like yours? What is that telling you about God? It's telling you, it's, it's magnifying his what? His humility, his condescension, his meekness. And, and that didn't stop when he was born. His whole life he revealed something. He said, because Satan said, oh, you are just sitting up on a high tower and you're big and that. He, they didn't understand who God was. He said, let me show you who I am. He came down here and he ministered and he humbled himself. He humbled himself. And if you want to become like God, that's what you have to do. You've got to just get up off of your high horse. Stop arguing for your own opinion. You have to say, I need to serve and I need to get down low. When God came to manifest himself to Moses after Moses in the wilderness for 40 years, he could have set the whole mountain on fire. He set a little tiny bush aglow. Why would he do a bush? He says, I'm meek and lowly in heart. And the Bible says that Moses actually became the meekest man in the whole world. That's what the Bible says. And so the incarnation is revealing something. It's revealing that if you're proud, you don't know nothing about God at all. The very first thing, you got to just be nobody. Right. Humble. I sir, came not to be ministered unto you, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The brazen altar represents the cross. Just as this animal that was sacrificed was on a pile of wood suspended on a grate between heaven and earth, Jesus was suspended on a wooden cross between heaven and earth. And that brazen altar with four horns represents that there's power in that blood that was shed. Where was Jesus? What was the name of the place where he was crucified? The Bible says the place was called Calvary. And that word in the Greek, it means skull or cranium. You've got to stop and think about this. You have to get something into your skull that you're not getting here. That's why he was taken to a place called cranium or skull. And the crucifixion where Jesus died for our sin, your sins and my sins. He died for what? Who, who, who did he die for? Who sin? Your sins and my sins. That was just the final act in a whole life of sacrificing. He sacrificed his time. He sacrificed his meals. When the, 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 the woman came to the well, they said, have you eaten? He said, no, I have meat, you know not. He didn't eat. He was like, I got to minister to people. He just kept serving and ministering. He would stay up all night in prayer to get fortified in order for him to be able to give, continually give, to sacrifice. And after he had given sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, speech to the dumb, he gave his life and he died on the cross. Everything that the Lamb of God suffered, he suffered for who? Me. You and for me. He willingly accepted what? What does it say here? What we deserve. He does so while we still make choices that cause him pain. What is he talking about? 
you know, when you see the, the sanctuary pictures of the coloring books, they show it all clean and all, it wasn't like that. It was a bloody, painful, animals moaning, ugly scene. It, just, it doesn't even really capture the suffering that Jesus had. Do you know that the reason he was whipped on his back? He was whipped on his back because you and I won't use our backs for his service. We use them for ourselves. You know why they put nails in his feet? It's because we won't go where we're supposed to go. The Spirit says, go talk to that person. And we don't do it. And look, what the penalty is? We should have big nails driven in our feet. He says, I'll take that. I'll take that for her. I'll take that for him. Why do we have nails driven in our hands? Because we won't do the things. We're doing our stuff. We're, we're taking care of me. And Jesus says, I will, you can put nails in my hand. I will take the penalty that they should take. Put the crown of thorns on my head because they won't use their minds and their thoughts and their emotions for me. I'll take all of that for them. So the Calvary is at the center of the courtyard and Calvary is revealing to us another aspect of his love. His holy place ministry if someone were to ask you, what does the priest do? I can ask 99, 100 people, 99 of them couldn't tell you. I'm going to give you one Bible text, what a priest does. Here it is in Acts 5. It's after Jesus was slain, slain and hung on a tree. God exalted him. That means he made him a priest at the right hand and made Jesus a prince and a savior to give two things. What's the first one? This high priest gives two things. He gives repentance and he gives to Israel forgiveness of sins. But you've got to go to the Greek to see how broad that is. Because that word repentance is metanoia. It means compunction. That means conviction of guilt. And what does it say here? Including reformation. Cleaning it up. It's a repentance that I'm not going to do it and I'm going to correct the problem. And the Forgiveness, it's not just pardon, it's freedom, deliverance, liberty. Huh. If, a high, if, you're, if you're an alcoholic and the high priest gives you forgiveness, he's giving you freedom, deliverance. What does that mean? What does that mean for the alcoholic? He's not doing it anymore. This, this forgiveness is more than just, I'm just going to cross it off on the record. He says, I'm going to set you completely free from it. That's what a high priest does. Jesus is exalted as prince and a savior to bring you conviction on sin and reformation in your life and to give you liberty, part of freedom, and deliverance. Now, at the time that Jesus was a high priest in a holy place, what was happening to the church? The church started out, remember the seven churches? What was the first church called? What was the first church called? I'll tell you, Ephesus. Ephesus, remember? And that was the pure church, and Smyrna was the persecuted church, and those first two churches were pure. And here's a picture of the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And I want you to see that the churches this, oh, sorry. They, they're going north. You see that? And when they get to the third church, Pergamum, it's, it's going east and starting to go south, and then it's going south. So what is that saying? I mean, geographically, the churches are saying what's going to happen spiritually, that God's people started out doing good. But when paganism came in, when Pergamus came in, they started going south. They started going down. And our high priest was still pleading, still pleading, still pleading. They're disobeying. Still pleading, still pleading, still pleading. It became, Thyatira was the Catholic church, still pleading for centuries. Even Sardis, the Protestant church, disobedient. God was still pleading. Now what is the, what's the last church now? And what is, what is, what is our Jesus, what is our high priest doing? He's still pleading. He's still trying to bring conviction reform, deliverance, liberty. He's cleaning, trying to clean up his church. For the last 15 centuries, from Pergamus in the year 300 until now, the churches are losing ground spiritually, but he doesn't quit. He's 
persistent. <laughs> you got that. That's what we need to be. When our children are disobedient, they're, doing, they're, they're talking back and not doing We got to just keep on, keep on, keep on, and be persistent. What does the most holy place ministry represent? When did it begin? What does it represent? Where did we get 1844 from? You guys had a Bible study here on it. Where did we get it from? What prophecy? 2300 day prophecy. By the way, I'm sorry I don't have the page there. It's, it's great controversy. I think it's 418. It says, The scripture above all others that was the foundation and pillar of our faith was unto 2300 2, days. Then shall the sanctuary be what? Cleanse. What does that word cleanse in the, in the Old Testament? Um, um, the word is, um, in the New Testament, I started, I said, Hebrew, that's, just, that's, um, that's correct. In the Old Testament, that word cleanse is sadak. And what does sadak mean? We all think it means to wash something. That's not what it means. Look it up in the strong. Sadak means to be or to make, right. to make it right. It means to fix it. To fix it. It means, you could say, cleanse permanently. That would be accurate. It means to actually fix it so it doesn't even get dirty anymore. Look at it in different Bible verses. New American Standard, properly restored. To make right again. It means to make something right. So what does it say about God that he's marrying a bride that was just lived a dirty life? But then he cleans her up and he marries her. What does that say about God? Well, it, it's love mixed with forgiveness, mixed with tenderness. You, you can't even really fully describe what that is, but it's precious and it's wonderful. And it's what he has for us. And that's what he's doing in the most holy place is he's finishing the work of making us right again. He's going to completely clean up his church. Revelation 19 says that when the marriage comes, it says, his wife hath made herself ready. She will be cleaned up by her high priest, and she will be clothed in linen, clean and white. That's what it says in Daniel 7. I'm not going to spend any time in this. But it says that when Jesus rose from the holy place and goes to the Ancient of Days, it says he receives three things. We think about David Thomas talking about, oh, 2,300 days, best day of judgment. He's, Jesus is receiving something. What three things? Dominion, glory. What's the third one? A kingdom. He's going to receive his bride. And but this is different. When he receives this bride, the Bible says, this kingdom shall never be destroyed. You know what that's saying? When he marries this bride, what does it mean? When I marry this bride, she will not taste death anymore. Amen. This bride's going to walk, going to get on a cloud and walk into heaven and will not die. Right. This bride will never be destroyed. All through the ages, God's people have been fed to lions, tortured, and all of these things. He says, when I marry this bride, this kingdom, she will never be destroyed. And she's symbolized by the 12 stones on the breastplate of the high priest. Those 12 stones represent the bride. That they have had, what does it say there? A, what kind of a change? A permanent change. They were once sand, and they were in solution. Then they crystallized and became an amethyst, and they will be an amethyst forever. You can drop them in water, they won't dissolve. They, their character is set. And God is going to do something for his people in the most holy place where their character will be set. That's important. The next event in the plan of redemption is the what? I'm going to move through this rapidly. People say that God's mercy is forever. Is that true? His mercy is forever. And in mercy, he will punish people in the end. It's actually in their best interest to be taken out. The Bible, when Moses was on the mount, and God revealed himself to him. He said, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, Keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will what? By no means clear the guilty. God is a God of justice. 
And the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so should it be when the Son of Man is revealed. And was Noah re received well by the people that lived around him? No. How did they treat him? <laughs> they mocked him, they opposed him, they ridiculed him. And Moses pled with them and pled with them, but it, it brought anguish to his soul, it brought anguish to his family. And those people didn't believe, you know, and it shows, like the story of Samson, that if you continue in sin long enough, even remarkable things will not change your mind. You know, in Samson, he had many times to recognize this woman was trying to kill him. But he became completely blind. And the people all around you in Indianapolis, if they continue on in sin, they will become unimpressible. Because in the days of Noah, when you see all of the animals walking two by two and getting on the ark, that should get your attention. You should say, wait a minute. The animals are doing what this man has been saying for hundreds of years. It should, and, it, and in Patriarchs and Prophets it says, it made a momentary impression. And then they went back to mocking until a little drop of water hit him in the forehead. Then another, and they said, it's never happened before, but it's happening now. And then what did they do? They believed. How do we know? Because their actions showed it. Your actions show what you really believe. And they were running now because now they believed. But guess what? It was too late. And, and the people that had despised the bride, that had given Noah and his sons and their wives all that grief, they were outside the ark. It will be the same as it was in the days of Lot. People will be doing all of the things that they've done all their life. Just that they did what? They did. They they, 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 they build it. But the same day, let me tell you something. The probation, it'll just be someone saying, you know what, it's time to leave Indianapolis. You need to move out of here. You need to get out of here. And when they said, you know what, you're crazy. I'm not doing that. Their probation closed that moment. Even though everything was going on, they made a decision. And that decision was because of their own choice. It was irrevocable. And you know what? Today, there are people that are mocking as they were in the days of Lot. Um, there were some street preachers in uh, North University, University of North Texas, and the, the anti-counter-protesters said the street preachers are on our campus, and they came out to mock them. And they said, we, do, we don't want to hear any about this word. You guys are out of your minds. You're crazy. And that's how the world is today. But the Bible says that a day is coming when the curtain will come down, and God's going to destroy them all. In one day. So that's talking about the justice of God. The last, the, the sixth event is, uh, is the second coming of Christ. And that's when he's going to shower on us blessings that we can't even imagine. Each of these events reveal to us a little bit more of his character. The incarnation reveals the what of God? The Calvary reveals his self-sacrificing nature. The holy place ministry reveals the person of God. The most holy place, it's love with forgiveness and kindness all blended together. The close of rotation, the whole world will understand the justice of God and then at the second coming his love will be manifested in all of these things that he has prepared for you that you, you can't even imagine what they are. He's got some wonderful things to say. I'm going to show you what I've been preparing for you for thousands of years. Come into heaven and I'm just going to be giving you gift after gift after gift. This, um, when the tabernacle was built, but moving on, I have 15 minutes, I want to get done. When the tabernacle was built in Exodus chapter 40, it describes how they put everything in place, and it says so Moses, what's that next word? Finish the work. When he got the last little thing in place, the Bible says a cloud covered the tent and an exceeding bright light called glory filled the tabernacle. That's telling you something. That's a prophecy. And it's saying that right now, your home, wherever you live, in, in um, Fishers or, or, or Avon or wherever you live, that in your home, he's trying to fashion you and get you to be a nice straight golden board. And he's going to put you in the church and assemble you all together. And when he gets all of the pieces of his sanctuary all over the world together, he's going to fill it with his glory. He's going to fill it with his character. And it's going to shine when the church is completed. And he's gathering those people now. People are leaving the church. They're going away from God. And others are coming in. And 
It happened again when the temple was built by Solomon and his helpers. But the signal was different. The Bible says that when the singers made, what does it say there in pink? When the singers made one sound, then the house was filled with the cloud. Glory to the Lord. So when the church starts speaking the same thing, when all of our doctrinal errors are all cleaned up, and the message is the same message in every church, that's when God's character is going to be revealed. So why is it important to behold this character? Because by beholding God's humility, his self-sacrificing nature, his justice, his generosity, it changes your motives. A lot of us are trying to obey because it's right. But I'm going to obey because it's right. No. That's not going to last. It's got to be a deep love for God and appreciation for who he is. When you start to understand how wonderful he is, you say, I just want to please him. I want to do nothing to hurt him. And when that becomes the motive, it becomes righteousness by faith. Amen. Let's move on. Last 15 minutes, the sanctuary. We're going to talk about the experiences real quickly in five slides. Each one of these tents around the tabernacle, one of those tents represents your house. And, and one of these tents, if you were living there, you would have to take a journey out here, get a lamb, come back in, and walk down and go through the courtyard. And then, carried by faith through the priest and the 12 stones, he would carry you all the way into here. So the sanctuary message is about a journey from your tent all the way where? God's going to make a way from your street address for you to go all the way to heaven. And, and in order for you to make that journey, you have to have, there's your tent, there's your tent right there. You have to have some experiences. You have to respond to these events. And there's 10 experiences. How many did I say? This is a whole 90-minute study. Here it is in three, three slides. It's 10 experiences. The first two take place in your tent. But you're not saved yet. you got to go get a lamb. Bring that lamb. You come to the gate of the court. And there you make a confessional of your sin on the head of the lamb. Then you step inside the courtyard where you're going to kill that lamb. And when you step across this threshold, then you're saved. You're standing inside the white linen fence. You're covered with his righteousness. Okay? And then you, and then you have to have an experience called death itself. So you have to have all four of these experiences... And after self dies, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, Lord, clean me up. Those are, those are one, two, three, four, five, six experiences in being converted. It's six different experiences. The Bible teaches of all those experiences. That's how you get connected to God. And the reason that we're experiencing so much defeat is in these six experiences. This is our biggest problem. We're trying to Bible study, pray, and witness, but we're not converted yet. And that's why we keep failing. So we got to go back to study these things. What does it mean to believe? Adventists are some faithless people. They'll talk about all kind of doubt and what they can't do. and won't. We need to be talking to faith about what God can do for us. And then there's three experiences here that keep you, that cause you to stay connected. This is how you get connected. This is how you stay connected. And then in this room, he wants to cleanse you permanently from sinning, where you become completely cleansed and permanently cleansed. Those 10 experiences divide into three general experiences. Here's the three experiences right here. The first experience is called in the Bible, in the courtyard. Just the holy place is called, that's the walk of faith. And the most holy place the parents is called perfection. What does perfection mean? It means becoming just like Jesus. You become just like Jesus in your character. So there's three summary experiences that God is saying, if you want to be saved, you need to start here and go all the way through. And I'm going to show you why that's very important. Here it is in Mark chapter 4. Three experiences. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the what? The full. full corn in the ear. Three experiences. First the blade, that's being converted, then the ear, but the ear is green, the little kernels of corn are green, that's sanctification, and then it becomes yellow corn, the full corn, that means you're fully grown, fully ripe in Christ. You could also describe it as being what? Cor right. Justification is born again. Holy Place experience called what? 2 Peter 3, last verse says, but grow in grace. 
And the third experience is called becoming what? I'm going to show it to you again. Here it is, 1 Peter 5, 10. It says that God wants to make us perfect. How? Three things he wants to establish. That's courtyard. Strengthen. That's holy place. Settle you. That's most holy place. 1 Peter 5, 10. He wants to make you perfect, but he has to establish you, strengthen you, settle you. He has to settle us because the time is coming. No mediator. you got to walk straight. There's no mediator. So he wants to settle you in an experience where... No matter what happens, you'll never take your hand out of his hands. I'm walking with God. You have to kill me. I'm walking with God. I don't even want to think about that. You'll just be walking with God. This is called three names again. Here's another thing you can call courtyard experience is what? Holy place. Most holy place. It's also called ceiling. It's three experiences. So these this is a detailed explanation in pictures of how God wants to save you. And I'm going to show you why this is important in the next five minutes. I'm not going to define these things now. But we eventually have to become sanctified completely and permanently. These three experiences add up to something called righteousness by faith. It's not taught anymore. We don't understand it. But these three experiences in... The plan of redemption in pictures, it was symbolized in pictures. It was showing what God wants to do. Once you step inside this courtyard and you're justified, if you were to die, you're going to heaven. You're saved. The thief on the cross, he just had met the Savior. Jesus said, I say to you today, you'll be with me in heaven. He was saved. He didn't get to walk the walk of sanctity. He was never sealed. So you're saved once you cross here. But in the last generation, you have to go all the way to this experience. And I'll show you that in, um, at this time right now. So the sanctuary, when you lay out all of the events, how many events are there in the plan of redemption? How many? Six. When you lay them out, they give you a timeline. Watch this now. We're going to talk about our generation, the last generation. This is the climax of our talk. Here it is. When did Jesus take on a body? When was, he, when was he conceived? I'll tell you the answer. 4 BC. When did he die on the cross? 27. I'll tell you. Yeah. He was baptized in 27. He died on the cross three and a half years later. What year was that? When did he start his holy place ministry? 40 days later. It was still 1831. And he did there for 18 centuries. When did he start his ministry in the most holy place? When will probation close? Well, we know this very soon. Because we saw that in the, the plans that in, in UK, what they're laying out for the counterfeit money, that they're laying plans right now to take away, but they don't have programmable crypto money for you. So it's going to be very soon that it's going to end. This is the slide I wanted to get to. I've been all that time to get to this slide right here. So, where are we on this slide? Are we here? Are we here? Are we here? Or somewhere in here. Well, what are we looking for next? I'll tell you. National Sunday Law, a little time of trouble. Watch this now. Watch this. Stay, stay with me right now. This is a timeline here. And after that, probation will close. So what do we call this period of time here? Between the close of probation and the second coming. What do we call that? We call that the time of trouble. The time of trouble. And in our generation, you have to prepare for that. The, all the Sunday churches are saying, there's going to be a rapture. You'll be gone. Won't experience anything. No, there won't be. You'll be here. You're going to have to be in the fiery furnace with Jesus. You ain't going to be escaping. You have to go through the fiery furnace. And so something has to happen in that most holy place ministry that prepares you to walk through here. And what was the experience of the most holy place called? He said justification, sanctification, perfection. perfection. Also called sealing. You have to be sealed. Why? This is, this is it. This is the climax. I don't want you, if you can get this, I'll be so happy. In our generation, there's two things that no other generation ever had to face. That we have to face. And so we have to have a different experience. What are those two things? We have to live a righteous life with no safety net. 
Jesus says, look, I, I'm going to come for you, but for me to come for you, i got to close the sanctuary so I can get on the cloud and come. So when I close the sanctuary, you can't be sinning. I'm going to close it, and you've got to be sin-free. Does that make sense? And then the other thing is, when he arrives, you must be what? Sin-free at the second coming so that he won't do what? Because the sinners, if you have sin in you, you will be consumed by the brightness of his coming. So he's going to have to have a people that have no sin in them. And Satan says, if I can just keep the church sinning, Jesus can never come. Because when he comes, he'll burn them up when he arrives. So he wants to keep people sinning because he knows if there's any sin in them, he can't come. And so we have a message to tell people how to get rid of sin and how to live without a safety net where well, you will obey. I'm going to show you there's a Bible text that tells you how people will obey. People say, that's blasphemy. People can't obey after Jesus calls the sanctuary. Yes, they can. There's a Bible text that tells us. Here it is. Great Counters in 425. Those living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease are to stand on the side of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be what? Their characters must be purified from sin by something in pain. What does it say? So you're praying, listen to this, as you're praying, you're saying, God, sprinkle your blood on me. That's the key. You're praying, Lord, I gotta stop lying, I gotta stop lusting, I gotta stop spitting, I gotta, but sprinkle your blood on me and cleanse it out of my experience. And the high priest says, I can do that. I can do that, I can, I can take it out of you. I'll put my blood and drops on you and take it out of you. It says, through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle of evil. Now watch this. It says, while the sins are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people. This work, the special work of purification, is more clearly presented in the messages of what? You need to know that the three angels' messages are supposed to tell you how to put sin out of your experience. They, those messages actually are to tell us that. These three angels. They are to teach us, you know, the first angel, the second angel, the third angel says, here's the patience of the, here are they that keep and have the, the faith of Jesus. That faith of Jesus is what's going to sustain them. Here's the Bible text, Isaiah 59. This is the Bible text that says that God's people will be obedient with no, with no intercessor. It says, I saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him. And what does it say there in blue? His righteousness, what? Ah, in the most holy place, He's going to put his righteousness in you. And it will sustain you. You will, you will be obedient with nobody in the sanctuary. You'll just obey because he'll put his righteousness in you and it will sustain you. Plagues will be falling. The wicked will be killing. Drones will be dropping bombs. It won't faze you. You just keep walking in obedience. Walking in love because he's going to put his righteousness in us. Whoo! How did we enter into that experience? On the yearly service, sins. On the daily service, the sins are going into the building. In the yearly service, the day of atonement, the sins are going which direction? They're coming out. The priest sprinkles his blood, and that cleanses and perfects their character. What are the three things that you need to do if you want to have your character cleaned up? You cannot just read the Bible. You have to meditate and ask God to show you what it means. You cannot just read the Bible. You need to do what, is this, what did I say? Meditate. You have to ponder. Sometimes you have to read the text over and over and over and over. Sometimes I read a Bible text 30 times in a row. I say, God, what is it saying? Teaching what it's Give me the truth out of this text. And as you meditate on the word, he will start to speak to you. And he will teach you about yourself. What did I say? Oh, he will teach you. You know what? We're influenced by each other too much. I was at a person's home and they had some lemon Oreos. And I said, can I have one of those? And I tasted it. I was like Eve in the Garden of Eden. 
three days later, I was coming from the ophthalmologist. My car just turned by its own will into the Walmart. And I bought a bag of lemon Oreo cookies out the front. And I called Wendy. I was talking to my wife. She said, what are you eating? I said, nothing. Because <laughs> my mouth was empty at the time. She said, did you just eat something? Yes, I was just eating some lemon Oreo cookie. <laughs> I cannot resist the influence of just the thought got in my mind. It's stuck in my mind. It's stuck in my mind. And three days later, I was buying a whole bag of Oreo lemon cookies because I'm not meditating on the word like I'm supposed to. Brother Steve, where are you making that stuff up? 5T, page 575. When Jesus, when this grand truth, what he's doing in the sanctuary above, when this grand truth is seen and understood, those who hold it will work in harmony with Christ. What is Christ doing? He's taking the bad things out. What is he doing? When you understand that, you will work in harmony with him. How can you work in harmony with him to get the bad things out? It says by, read it for me, study. Here's the word, contemplation. It says you will be brought into harmony with the cleansing. You've got to, not study means you learned it. You didn't read it. If somebody asks you, you can tell them where it is. Oh, that's in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. When you study something, you know where it is. Let's learn it, and then you have to contemplate it, and it'll go into your experience, and it'll change you. What are you praying about? You're praying to take the bad things out, to take sin out of your spiritual nature, evil thoughts out of your mind, toxins out of your body. You've got to do all three of those things. You want to be cleaned up? You've got to get the bad things out. What are the bad things? Sin out of your mind, your body, you got to detox your body. Some of us are so toxic, our breath is, it can only accurately be described as evil. Not bad breath, your breath is evil because of all the stuff that you eat. And God wants us to get cleaned up so that our breath can be sweet like lemon. <laughs> What's the third thing we got to do? We've got to stop Overworking. Brother Skeet, where did you get that from? Leviticus 16 says, on the day of atonement, to do no work at all. Does everybody have to have a job? Yes, but don't let your job interfere with your Bible study. You get so tired and exhausted, you lay down at 9 o'clock, open your Bible at 9 o'clock, you're gone. Amen. That's Pharaoh's plan, by the way. Pharaoh is the one in Egypt to overwork God's people. In Exodus 5, 9, the mother said, I'm going to go out and worship for God three days. Moses, uh, Pharaoh said, let there, what's the next two words? He said, take away their straw. Let them make bricks without straw. He said, don't let them listen to vain words. Right now, the biggest problem I have is you're working too much. You're running out to taking care of your kids. You're doing this, you're doing all of that. You don't have time for God. You don't have time to study and pray. You can't give God 10 minutes a day and expect your whole life to be changed. You gotta make big time for God. You gotta make an hour, 90 minutes, two hours. You gotta put God first. I have to put God first so that I can make time for him. I've got to eliminate overwork in the office and overwork at home if you want your character to be changed. And you have to afflict your soul. We don't have time to talk about that. Here it is, that same two pages, Great Controversy 488. We have to search our hearts. We have to, this is for me, put away that light frivolous spirit. You need to be sober. We're living in a time where we need to be sober. And so we need to change. Leviticus 16, we've come to the end of our slide program. The Leviticus 16 service. After God completely cleaned up his church, he had one of the representatives who was a fit man do something at the end of the Day of Atonement. He took a rope and he took the scapegoat and he dragged him out. A goat is a big animal, and the desert was hot, and it didn't take, the goat is very smart, it didn't take very long where the goat said, this isn't gonna work out for me. So the goat starts fighting the fit man. That's why the man had to be fit. You have a goat that's this tall that has big horns, you gotta know what you're doing, or that goat will kill you. Yeah. And so this man, who was fit, who was trained, he says, I got this. And with everything that the goat did, he dealt with the goat. He grabbed the horn, he slammed it on the ground, he put ropes on it, and he drags this goat. 
goes out, and the people are all around the courtyard, and they're saying, to the pit, to the pit, and they're just chairman. People are saying, can he handle it? Can he do it? And they say, the priest has picked just the right man for the job. He's got this. And he drags his goat way out in the wilderness, and the, and the Jewish commentaries say that Azazel was actually cast into a, over a precipice. In the ancient Hebrew time, they took him to a canyon. He binds his goat, and with a mighty shout, he throws it into a pit. And that is the end of the goat. In Revelation 18, it talks about, Revelation 20 talks about an angel coming down with a great chain and cast Satan to the bottomless pit. That fit man, back the picture up, that fit man represents the bride that is strong for combat and beautiful in character. It represents the church. And it represents that there's going to be a conflict going on. And during the time of trouble where Satan is trying to get the 144,000 to sin, but they will not sin. And that will answer the final charge that man can't keep the law. And after that, he goes into a pit for a thousand years. So God is going to have a church just like the woman, the certain woman. And she will be used of God to break the head of Abimelech. Right now, friends, for two and a half years, the whole world was distracted with COVID. Every story on the television was COVID vaccination, COVID vaccination. Now it's shifted. Now it's the war in Ukraine. The whole world is distracted with that. It's all they want to talk about. Then last week, it's about the Oscar slap, and they're talking about that. Everybody's talking about everything but what Jesus is doing. Oh, I want to tell you about the gas. The price is going way up. It's all a big distraction. Satan just saying, keep distracted, and don't, call, don't become the fit man that takes me to the pit. But God's going to have a people. He's going to get every piece uh, together in his tabernacle. And through the blood of sprinkling and his own, their own diligent effort, their characters will be perfected. Their prayers will ascend. There will be people that will afflict their souls and say, Lord, I need to get victory over this. I need to get victory over this flaw in my character. Take it out of me. They'll afflict their soul. They'll say, sprinkle this blood upon me till I can be free. And then they will be ready to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator, because this most holy place ministry will have accomplished it. They will be able to walk the tightrope without a safety net. How many of you want to walk the tightrope without a safety net? God says, I can make it so that you can do it. I can be with you in that time of trouble. How many of you need extra grace, extra strength, extra time? That's your desire. By your heads, right where you're sitting. You're going to pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we've been sitting a long time.